This event will be focused on the 2016 presidential campaign, and we are so thrilled to have you with us as we close out our 2014-15 academic year program calendar uh, with tonight's event. I want to quickly give a special thanks to members of the Institute of Politics team who not only have made tonight possible, but for those of you who've been with us over the course of the year, you have no doubt experienced multiple events and certainly heard about many others, more than 120 events, sessions like this at this very venue and venues across campus, trying to elevate and expand the public conversation. We couldn't do it without our fabulous team, so I want to recognize Mallory McClare, Amin Sinji, Christine Hurley, and our communications team as well, which includes Matt Jaffe, Zane Maxwell, and Lucy Little. They're the folks who are responsible for bringing you all of this throughout the year. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. We're, thr we're thrilled to have students with us, community members, and many alums as well. For those of you who have uh, come to campus for Alumni Weekend and yet to experience what we do, we want to take a quick moment to show you a few highlights. So here is the IOP in action in 2014-15. I believe, what do you believe, I believe that there is meaning in politics. I believe that this is a worthy thing to be involved in. I, I've seen, as messy and as maddening as the process is, I've seen real meaningful change that has touched people's lives. And I think we have to fight back against this persistent cynicism that says that uh, there is no point, that, that there is no difference, that we shouldn't bother being involved. The best part about the Speaker Series program is that it gives students the opportunity to engage in meaningful conversations with political leaders and thinkers. You know, those, those experiences where you get an opportunity not just to see speakers, but to talk with them, you know, before or after, it's just very empowering for students here. To those of you who are studying here and feel a passion in your heart to get into public service and into politics, I, I just want to encourage you in the strongest way to follow that passion and follow your heart. Uh, because uh, your country needs you and your world needs you. I had a student come up to me and my speaker and say, you know, I was feeling really cynical and disillusioned about government, and but after kind of hearing this talk and, you know, and coming to your seminars, like, it leaves me feeling renewed about, like, participating in public service. And, like, how great is that? This experience at the Institute of Politics has been very affirming with regard to my belief in the future of the country. Um, you know, the future of our politics. The student energy here is fantastic, people are engaged, and that's the whole point of the IOP, is to give students uh, insights into the way our government works, whether you're right, left, or center. I just, I am so inspired by these, by these kids. They have so much enthusiasm, so much excitement for what they're doing. I have to tell you, this is the best t-shirt experience I've ever had, both in terms of the caliber of the students, in terms of the caliber of the program, in terms of the, what I got out of it. I mean, what more do you need? You got like one of the most brilliant political minds of all time at one of the best universities of all time. I was always a little wary about DC overall as an environment because I felt like, is it going to be too fast paced for me? Am I going to be able to navigate things? But the University of Chicago has a really strong network here. We met with so many alumni, so many people who have graduated or come through programs at the university. And it really assured me that if I were to come here, not only would I have the support and backing of the people in Chicago, but also a new network of people here who would be willing to help me. For me, Des Moines was always this like magical, like fairy tale land because we had heard so much about it in the boot camps and during the winter. And going to Des Moines, it was it was amazing. This track made me realize why Iowa matters. 
was really fascinating were the individual interactions. So particularly like on the floor, I got a. Uh, walk around with Representative Gazzardi as he went around to try to, you know, drum support for this bill he's working on. Uh, it was really fascinating to see the, you know, the one-on-one -on -one, uh, talks. That's what I really gained out of that experience. The more helpful thing about this trek was the fact that I learned and I learned what I wanted to do and now I know the types of companies I want to look for and I, then I can make connections with them later. This summer, I will be working in the broadcast media department in the Office of Communications at the White House. To be able to walk into the White House as a college student, it, it's surreal. It's something that I see in politics and in media all the time, and to actually have access to that and be able to engage more fully in that is something that's so special to me. The Maroon Veterans Alliance, or MVA, is um, a new organization where we work to help veterans get the support and the tools necessary to come back into the job market. What was really exciting was when we, when we found out about the um, Student Civic Engagement Projects was that we found a way for us to take what we, want, what we had already done and what we wanted to do more of and do it through, an organ, through a group that is so knowledgeable and that knows what they're doing and has the tools to help us really grow. And when we had found out about that, we knew it was kind of a, we knew it was a perfect match. New Americans is a student civic engagement program um, with the IOP, getting students together to come out here to the Instituto del Progreso Latino and volunteer and help people just like me who are applying for citizenship prepare for their interview. I think the student civic engagement programs are an amazing way to hands-on engage. My, my whole point in being here at the Institute of Politics is to try and urge uh, these young people who have huge concerns about a whole range of issues to get in there and make a difference. It's been a great career for me to be involved, a great calling for me to be involved in this, uh, and I want to urge others to take the same path. Look at the Institute of Politics. My thanks to Zane Maxwell and our team for producing that video. My thanks as well to the staff and especially our students who've helped deliver this work and inspire us to do it. So without further ado, let me introduce, introduce one of our student leaders to get our program started tonight. His name is Luke Wetterstrom. He's a second year here at the college. Hills from St. Paul, Minnesota. He's a political science major, very active in the IOP, where he is going to be a new student advisory board member next year. He's been an intern this year for the IOP staff. He's also been involved in our student political journal, The Gate. He's active in a number of other campus organizations as well. And if any of you are looking for a tour of campus, he's your guy, because he's a campus tour guide. He says that uh, politics is his passion. He follows it as closely as a sporting match, and he's in the right place tonight. So please join me in welcoming Luke Wetterstrom to get us started. Luke. There's only one thing certain about the 2016 election. It matters. The next president will lead our country as we address issues ranging from immigration to health care. They will, almost certainly, have the ability to name multiple Supreme Court justices. They will choose how our country engages with an increasingly complex world around us. It is not an exaggeration to say that whoever is the next president will have the opportunity and responsibility to change both this country and the world. What is far less certain, however, is who this person will be. On the Democratic side, is Hillary Clinton as inevitable as many in the media are making her out to be? Or is it possible that Bernie Sanders or another challenger will achieve a once-in-a-lifetime political upset? The Republican side features the most expansive list of credible contenders in recent memory. Which among them has what it takes to survive the primary gauntlet? Today, we have the fortune of being joined by some of the finest journalists in this country covering national politics in order to help us answer these questions. Nate Cohen is a writer specializing in using data-driven analytics to help us make sense of politics and public policy. He is currently a writer for the New York Times' Upshot blog, and before that was a staff writer for the New Republic. 
McKay Coppins is a senior political writer at BuzzFeed News and the author of The Wilderness, a forthcoming book on the future of the Republican Party. Previously, he covered politics for Newsweek and the Daily Beast. Uh, Jill Lawrence is an award-winning journalist currently working as a contributing editor to US News and World Report and is a national columnist for the Creator Syndicate. She has covered every presidential campaign since 1998 and was named as one of the top 10 campaign journalists in 2004 by the Columbia Journalism Review. Our final panelist, panelist is Karen Tumulty, a 2013 recipient of the Toner, Toner Prize in Political Reporting and a national political correspondent for the Washington Post. Before coming to the Washington Post, she was a writer for the Time Magazine where she wrote or co-wrote over three dozen cover stories. And last but not least is our moderator for the evening, the man who needs no introduction, Mr. David Axrod, the director of the Institute of Politics. And finally, I would like to welcome everyone here in the audience and thank you for being here with us this evening. Hey, everybody. So we're here to talk about the road to 2016. It is the nature of presidential campaigns that um, it is June of 2015, and we're talking about the road to 2015. But uh, I've uh, been involved in several presidential campaigns, and I've covered several, several presidential campaigns. And the one lesson that I've learned uh, about them is how many things we treat as determinative on the road to wherever turn out not to be. And I, just to underscore the point, I wanted to uh, show a uh, slide back here and ask the panel uh, if they can uh, identify what all these people had in common. Oh, I know. I, know. I think I know too. I know. Karen? They were all Republican front runners at one time or another. Meaning? Meaning they were, the, they were leading the polls. Right. OK. <laughs> yes, even Donald Trump. So uh, I just have to tell you this story as we begin this conversation. Uh, in uh, 2011, in April 2011, I was at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Several of you may have been there. All of you may have been there. And I'm walking down the aisle, and there's Donald Trump. And I overhear the conversation, and he says to the person he's talking to, I know it's crazy, but I'm ahead in the polls. He says, who knows what could happen? <laughs> so I felt like stopping and saying, I know what's going to happen. <laughs> but, uh, but I raise this point to say um, how, how many twists and turns these things take. And what I'd like to do tonight is try and sort out the real from the unreal, to talk about where we are right now uh, and, what, and what we can reasonably deduce from that about what's likely to come, and then talk a little bit about uh, what are the milestones ahead that are going to be important. Understanding that presidential races often turn on things like um, candidates uh, not being able to name their list of three in a debate or stuff like that that you, can't, you couldn't possibly predict. Um, so uh, with that, the one thing that we can say Oh, well, I, I guess I have my little, my little video, huh? Yeah, I, I poached this from USA Today today. I was supposed to do this at the front, just to start to get everybody in the mood. I'm here tonight. I stand before you today. To say this, the most important words of my life. Today, I proudly announce my candidacy for President of the United States of America. My generation, your generation, will pass the torch to the next generation. We want to live in America that works for all of us. We need a president who shares our values, embraces our agenda. You believe, as I do, fulfilling the promise of America. I believe we are the indispensable nation. I believe we can do better. I believe we must build on our success, not rest on it. I want prosperity to spread its wings all across America. The hour has rung for us, we the people to rise up and take back our democracy and our government. And like the founders of the Republic, we seek change. I'm beginning conversation with you, with America. During the next year, I shall discuss in detail a wide variety of problems 
which a new administration must address. Preserving the American dream. So our leadership has built the vision or the wrong vision. For our children's sake and for the sake of humanity, we must be the leader of the world. Number two is not in America's DNA. Many this year will ask for your support. <laughs> Much will be made of our characters. I'm not running for president to be somebody, but to do something. This campaign will decide what our children have a right to expect of America and what America has a right to expect of them. So I want to bring a voice your voice to the White House. We stand for freedom and opportunity and hope. We must continue the longer American march to broaden liberty. I believe that the courage of Americans can change this country. Don't tell me what we can't do. This is not just a campaign for the presidency. It is a campaign for the future. Will you join me? I believe that together we can keep this rendezvous with destiny. So uh, that would have been a great way to start this whole conversation. <laughs> but it was great to see all these old historical figures. I mean, you look way back from, remember Jerry Brown? So I used to I'd do that when I go to California. I say, I've been in this so long that Jerry Brown was governor when I started in this business. And his great technological innovation. Yes. The 800 number. Yes, exactly, the 800 number. Um, so let's take a look. The, 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 the one thing about this announcement thing is it's so, so compelling that now everybody's doing it. Uh, let's take a look at all the people who have uh, already joined this race for president. Can you guys see over the panel? Um, and uh, so it turns out the road to, to, one thing we can say for sure is the road to 2016 is very crowded. Uh, it's like the Manhattan of politics. And then let's look at uh, those, who, there's still potentially more to come. Um, so let's, let's You're take it. You're missing a guy, Donald who? Trump. Oh yeah, Donald Trump. We are missing Donald Trump. <laughs> so, the least I could do, having made him the butt of my story, is include him on the list of. Uh, oh yeah, Willie Wilson. Did you know that a candidate for mayor, a, a failed candidate for mayor of Chicago, announced for president of the United States? So it's a stepping stone. Um, but let's let's put the, the the announced candidates back up for a second, um, and let's talk a little bit about it. First of all, let me ask the obvious question, which is. Why, why is the Republican feel uh, so crowded uh, this year? I mean, this is the largest field that I can uh, remember. Karen, you want to? Uh, I think there are three reasons. Uh, one is that this is a party where the next guy in line almost always gets it. And in this, this is one of the few years that I can think of where there's not an obvious next guy in line. There's no incumbent vice president. The guy who came in second last time was Rick Santorum. I don't think many people are giving him. I think the second really big factor is uh, money. The fact that you can get in a race and you have one guy who's willing to write you a check for half the cost of a yacht, uh, and you've got table stakes. And, you know, I think. The, the third one is simply that, you know, the, the media has sort of leveled everybody uh, in that there are just ways of getting your message out, too, that, that can sort of get your name out and get your identity out really quickly. It is true that the, the Republican Party had this uh, mm -hmm. tradition of nominating the, the, the runner-up from the last time. That's been a, a well-worn uh, pattern. Uh, but it's also true that the, the Republican establishment has ultimately prevailed and anointed the candidate. Uh, Jill, uh, the Re Republican establishment uh, by and large seems to be for Jeb Bush, but they're a little bit divided this year. I mean, if you were to say, is, is he the unequivocal establishment candidate here? Um, I would say no. Uh, there's a lot going against him, starting with his name. And he has some policy positions. You, you think Jeb is not a presidential man? <laughs> <laughs> Jeb would be fine if that was his last name. <laughs> uh, 
you know, he's, he's got these positions that don't necessarily jive with the party. The, uh, he's, he's for immigration reform, full-fledged, full-blown immigration reform. And he's for common core education standards. So he's got those things going against him. Uh, plus, he hasn't been in office a while. And he's in his 60s. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, <laughs> But you know, there's younger people coming up and a lot of competition, in fact, for that establishment slot from people like Marco Rubio and Scott Walker, many, many governors and former governors. You know, there's a lot of people who could qualify for that. And this is, just to add to Karen's list, I think they feel it's a very valuable nomination this time around because you know the Democrats have a potential nominee who has flaws. There's already been two terms of a Democrat. And generally speaking, it's easier for the other party to win in those circumstances. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a good year, and it's probably going to be a good year for one of those establishment people, but possibly not Jeb. So we'll, and we'll get back to the other possibilities there. But uh, Nate, uh, back in, um, in 2010, when we lost the, um, we, when I worked for the president, uh, and the Democratic Party lost the midterm elections, um, the day after the election, I said to the president that I thought that the seeds of his reelection had been planted. And he looked at me like I was crazy. You know, there's the old story about Churchill when he lost 1946 after leading Britain through the war. And Lady Clementine said to him, well, it's a blessing in disguise. And he said, well, it's rather well disguised. <laughs> and I think that's what the president felt. But uh, the reason I felt that way was because it seemed to me that a very, very virulent, uh, or, or very strident, I should say, uh, group of Republicans had gain some control over the party and we're going to, and any nominee was going to have to go through that very expensive toll booth. Uh, Jill just said Jeb uh, is, um, is in jeopardy because he supports uh, immigration reform and common cause and so on, uh, common core, uh, common, uh, common core standards, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but isn't his gamble that uh, that is a, those are positions that might make him, at least on the immigration side, a more saleable candidate. And I, what about this notion of the Republican base being out of step with the, Repu with the, uh, the voters you need to win a general election? Yeah, I mean, the, the traditional way for the Republicans to win the White House, to overwhelmingly win the religious right, and then do just well enough among uh, relatively religious white voters, uh, no longer works. Uh, the country has become substantially more diverse, and it's made it much more difficult for the Republicans to win in states like Virginia and Colorado. And at the same time, the Republican Party has even appeared to alienate some moderate whites outside of the North. Obama won Iowa, which was carried by President Bush. He won New Hampshire, which was carried by President Bush in 2000. He easily won states like Wisconsin and Oregon and Maine that were competitive. So there's this broad Republican problem that their old pathway to victory doesn't work and they don't seem to be as good at winning their old pathway in part because they've lost these young northern white voters um, that were more competitive a decade ago. And I think their policy positions probably are a big part of that. The margin by which Romney lost the Hispanic vote was far greater uh, than the margin that Bush lost either times or John McCain for that matter in national conditions that were much worse. And I think Although the millennials came up narrow when the Republicans were, you know, not making, not putting their best foot forward with the, uh, the Bush administration, that they're also out of step on cultural issues. Um, but within the Republican primary electorate, um, can a candidate, can, can, a, can the Bush experiment uh, work? Can you win w with the positions that he has? It's easier than people give it credit for, and I think there are two reasons why. One is that there's very little competition on this side of the party. There's going to be a lot of people fighting to win Iowa and to win the very conservative vote. There are very few candidates who are competing for rel relatively moderate Republicans. And so that gives you, uh, just a, a, in terms of your position, it's a nice place to be. Uh, the second reason is that there are more moderate Republicans than people, people think. When we imagine today's Republican Party, we think of these elected officials in, in Washington, right, who are winning these extremely conservative districts in the South. But the overall Republican national primary electorate includes people in places that the Republicans never win. So there's this whole half of the Republican primary electorate whose voice is not heard in Washington. It's substantially more moderate uh, than the Republican primary electorate that is reflected in the GOP congressional delegation. I would also add that on immigration in particular, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a, a totally uh, 
disadvantageous uh, issue for Jeb Bush in the Republican primary because the business wing of the party, uh, which makes up a large portion of the donor class, that's, that's not to say it's a large portion of the primary voters, but certainly of the donor class, is relatively supportive of immigration reform for issues that range from the ideological to their own economic and financial interests of their business owners. Um, and so Jeb Bush, one of the reasons he's been able to so quickly uh, corner the, the, a huge market of, of, of Republican donors is because they actually like and appreciate his, uh, his rhetoric on immigration. That's why you see actually uh, Marco Rubio, while he's kind of stuck in between a conservative base that hates what he's tried to do on immigration reform. He's but one of the group that tried that. He was in the gang of aid in, yes. the, in the Senate, that uh, the bipartisan gang that tried to come up with an immigration reform bill. Uh, the conservative base really disliked that and, and still uh, holds that over Rubio's head. At the same time, when he meets with donors, and I've talked to a lot of the kind of big donors and fundraisers he meets with, they inevitably ask him about that and say, you should be talking more about this on the campaign trail. So that's something that Jeb Bush uh, benefits from. And so I, I don't think we can totally say that immigration reform is a losing issue in a Republican primary for that reason. So this was a big day in, in presidential politics. Uh, Rick Perry announced that he's going to run again. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, yesterday, Lincoln Chafee uh, made his long-awaited announcement day. for president. <laughs> Uh, on the Democratic side, and we got the stunning news that Jeb Bush is actually going to announce his candidacy for president after a long period of contemplation. <laughs> Jill, what was that long period of contemplation about? I think it was about raising as much money as possible before he couldn't raise as much money as possible, and he would be s subject Explain to Explain that, that, though, because... Uh, well, I'm not a campaign finance expert, but once you declare your candidacy, you're very limited in the amounts of money you can raise, and you can't have any contact with your political action committee that's raising scads of money independently. So, so you know, he, he's running that string out as far as he can and, and piling up as much as he can. His pack is called Right to Rise. And, you know, once he declares, they're on their own, although there are reports that he's outsourcing his whole campaign to the PAC, and so he won't need as much money to do whatever it is he's going to do as a candidate. I mean, it's all... The whole system has become ripe for gaming. The, uh, uh, in, in 2012, Mitt Romney had a super PAC, and that super PAC arguably saved him in that primary campaign when he was in a very uh, uh, tough race. Uh, Jeb Bush is going to have, by all accounts, exponentially more. But others will as well, Karen. You, you talked a, a little bit about the fact that the uh, emergence of oligarchs in our politics have, you know, if you get an oligarch, you can hang around. Uh, Ted Cruz, in the first few days of his candidacy, put together $35 million into his super PAC, or $35 million was pledged. What does that mean? How does that distort the usual? Usually what happened is you'd run, you wouldn't do well in a place, and because you couldn't raise any money, you would quit the race. Uh, that's no longer true, is it? It's, um, I, you know, a good example in 2012 was Newt Gingrich, who his life support essentially was Sheldon Adelson. I mean, he wouldn't have been on the stage in South Carolina still to win the South Carolina the, uh, primary. The Las Vegas The Las Vegas billionaire. casino billionaire had it not been for Sheldon Adelson's money. And so it keeps people in the race. It could prolong the race. But um, there's a downside to this, too. I, I was talking to this guy, David Axelrod, about a year ago, and he was... You, use a credible source. <laughs> well, actually, I was... Newt Gingrich made the exact same point you did, which is that you also... Well, use a credible source. <laughs> I'm sure he did. <laughs> but that you also end up losing a little bit of control of your message. And, you know, in the case of your campaign, you were having to answer for ads that were run by an outside super PAC that essentially accused yes. Romney of killing a guy's wife. Um, or Newt, something like that. Well, that was, that was what we were all supposed to come yeah. away from those ads believing. So, you know, on the one hand, it, it's the life support. It keeps you going. Uh, it makes sure that, you know, you're answering things. But on other ways, the, the candidate loses his 
part of his or her own voice and his or her own ability to connect with voters on whatever issue that day they want to do. But McKay, doesn't it then make sense that um, uh, that Bush has done what Jill suggests and sent, he sent his main man, Mike Murphy, Mike Murphy yeah. uh, great strategist, also by way of full disclosure member of the board of the IOP, uh, sent him over to run the super PAC. Uh, so his, his, his key strategist is going to be making the super PAC right. decisions. Well, and he's not the only one. Rand Paul's uh, super PAC is being run by Jesse Benton, who is uh, who, who has both worked on his campaigns and also is married to his niece or something like that. So he, you know, he's basically part right. of the family. They see each other at family again. reunions, yes. right? But my, my point is, Thanks part of the thank future Thanksgivings could be very rough <laughs> if this doesn't go well. Indeed, yeah. but but this is what's interesting. About, I mean, this is why the, there is a risk, absolutely, like Karen is saying, of losing your message or losing hold of your message, but. Jeb Bush is a great example of how to navigate this because basically what he's done, not only has he sent Mike Murphy, his chief strategist, who he's been kind of planning with and plotting with this whole time, over to run the Super PAC, so you can already guess that they're going to be on the same page. He's also, you, you can guarantee, spent all this time before he officially becomes a candidate when there are no laws or regulations as to how he can uh, coordinate with the, the people at the Super PAC going through the next year, right, going through the primary and saying, okay, if this happens, we, do, we respond this way. You know, the, the, these four candidates, these are their key weaknesses. These are the messages that we want to drive. They, they have their playbook ready to go, uh, completely coordinated with the super PAC. So once he actually becomes a candidate and he has his own campaign and they're technically not coordinating anymore, the idea, at least, the, the theory, is that they won't really need to because they've already done all their planning in advance. Hence the long period of reflection. Right. Um, <laughs> Soul can searching. We, can, we take a, can we take a, a look at the, uh, at the polls that, that, that came out this week? And I, I put them up. The reason I wanted to show the six front runners was to uh, discount, uh, uh, to, to discount all of these to some degree. But Nate, uh, what if anything do these uh, polls tell us at this point where you have no one uh, higher than the low single digits on the Republican side? I think they tell us very little. Um, and if they tell us anything, okay, it's let's that move in on. terms of public opinion, <laughs> it's that's an open race in terms of the public. There's nothing about any of this amount of support that anyone is bringing into this race that makes them particularly impressive. And, and yet, and yet, when you hear people talk, uh, Jill, when you hear people talk about the Republican race, they, s they talk about a first tier of candidates. How is that first tier determined? What is that based on, yeah. given this muddle that you see behind you? Well, I, the first thing that people look at, I think, is um, state polls. Because when you look at Iowa and New Hampshire and, and some of the other early states, you, you do see people who are consistently doing well. For instance, Scott Walker does well in Iowa. I, I think that Bush is doing pretty well in New Hampshire. So, so th these are the places that are going to decide, you know, who has early momentum. And so you look at that. And I, I think, you know, these first tier candidates, if you look at them, they're all three establishment types. Why don't you say who you think the first tier is? Uh, well, and uh, see if you guys all agree on who the first Jeff tier Bush, is. Bush, Marco Rubio, and. Um, and Scott Walker. You agree? I do. And, and, and based on? I, I think I, I take a slightly different um, read of the evidence. I think that I look for two things. One is whether a candidate seems, reason, seems compelling enough that they can generate a large amount of elite support. All of those three candidates can do that. And the second thing is whether they have potential to appeal broadly throughout the party. A lot of the people that ha get the most attention, like Ted Cruz and Rand Paul, have fundamentally limited appeal. Jeb Bush might have a somewhat of a problem on the right, but he's an acceptable nominee throughout the party. Scott Walker isn't just an acceptable nominee throughout the party. I think most of the party actually is completely on board with his policy views. And I think that there are not very many Republicans who, after those three, it's very hard to come up with Republicans with the combination of support from the people that can fund and sustain a campaign and breadth of national appeal. This is one of the reasons that Marco Rubio, before he announced when he was still polling in like the middle single digits, uh, so he would not have 
seemed like he was top tier when you looked at it. Why people like the Bush campaign, uh, Mitt Romney when he was flirting with another run, saw Rubio as a legitimate threat because even though he was polling at like four or five percent, his favorability ratings within the party were higher than anybody else. And also, if you ask the question, would you be okay or would you accept these candidates as a nominee, he actually pulled the highest in the Republican Party. And so that, that's one thing you also have to look at. The, there, are, there are candidates who may not be uh, the first choice of a plurality of, of voters, but they're the second choice of, of a large majority of the, of the party. Um, and so that's something to look at. The other thing I would say when you're distinguishing between top tier, second tier, third tier, is um, it, it's like with March Madness, when you're filling out your bracket, you can't only go on statistics or record alone. I say this as a BYU alumnus with a team that often looks good on paper, but if you watch them, it's a bunch of white guys shooting threes. Um, and I think that if you, uh, why, if there are certain candidates that, I know this, would go, this might run contrary to the, uh, the data journalism, <laughs> but I think if you look at some of these candidates on the trail, watch them do interviews, ask them about policy, you can get a pretty good sense of where they are in, uh, in terms of how ready they are to compete. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really important question, and it's one I wanted to ask, because as we were sitting here, um, if we were sitting here four years ago, having this discussion at about this time, we would all, and you were asked to pick um, sort of the top tier, Probably Romney would be in that tier, but Paul Lenti would have been in it. And Perry, right? Right. Rick Perry was the hot candidate mm -hmm. of the summer of 2011, uh, and um, um, so I mean, I guess we don't have to rehearse what happened to him, <laughs> but um, but it does matter what candidates do on the trail. It does, I mean, I, I, I make this point often when I'm talking about presidential politics. They are tests, they are gauntlets. You know, so it's one thing that is not entirely predictable is how people will deal with the pressures of running for president of the United States. Um, McKay just said he's been watching candidates on the trail, uh, and I open this up to anyone, uh, and including Nate, who confesses that he mostly sits in front of his computer all day. But I can watch candidates on YouTube. Oh, yes. <laughs> I've thoroughly scouted the candidates from afar. <laughs> okay, that's good, and less wear and tear. Um, by the way, does every, do, do all you sort of data geniuses at the New York Times have to be named Nate? No. <laughs> I just want to just question that. But, um, uh, Tell me what you guys see out there in these candidates. What, what, let me, let me uh, uh, let's for a second just land on Scott Walker. Uh, when you go out and you see Scott Walker, what, what is it that you see? Um, I see, and particularly in the, um, the big event he did in Iowa that really put him at the top of the polls there, again yesterday in Florida, he does seem to have an ability to connect. Uh, yeah. He seems fairly good on his feet. And if, back to March Madness, if in fact the Republican primary is a bunch of brackets, you know, the social conservatives, the Tea Party, the, the establishment, he seems to be a guy who could get a, a sort of a toehold in all those brackets. He, he's not gonna turn off any of them. Uh huh. And um, now you wrote a column about him today, but it was more to make a, I'm talking about you, Jill. Oh, me? Yes. <laughs> you, oh, I uh, I, yeah, I should be more clear about this. Uh, about about uh, Walker and his positioning, but it was more to make a point, a larger point. What, what was your sense of what, because I, I just want to take a few minutes on what these three top tier, can, and it may be tough with Bush, but what is it that they represent? What is it that they're offering? Yeah. Well, Scott Walker actually has, is a very conservative uh, purveyor of the conservative message. The column I wrote was about, uh, he blames Democrats, he says Democrats measure success by dependency on government. And that's, you know, part of a, a pitch that also includes, you know, I took on the unions and I won 
so I can take on anybody and win. And I won three elections. Including in, ISIS. Right. <laughs> no, you said that. I, I won three elections in four years in a blue presidential state. So, you know, I mean, he's, he's got a lot of different things that he says. I mean, but the main thing that he is uh, from what, and I do a lot of YouTubing, uh, but he, he's very easy and comfortable with an audience. And he tells stories about buying things at markdowns, at calls, and he, you know, n he's friends with everyone, and he knows everyone, and he just, you know, there are no dead spaces, there's no cringe-worthy moments or anything like that. He just does a really nice job of presentation. He's very likable, and Jeb Bush is very likable, and Marco Rubio is very likable, and, you know, a lot of these people just come across in really nice ways, and, and, and in some cases they may be saying things that a lot of people would disagree with, but they seem like very nice guys. And. Um... <laughs> Just saying. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nicely put. Um, uh, what about Rubio? Marco Rubio actually um, is somebody, I, so I've covered all the announcements so far um, and a lot of other campaign events. And Marco Rubio's uh, campaign announcement, it was in Miami at the Freedom Tower where uh, Cuban refugees uh, decades ago, is this is where they would first come when they were coming to America. Um, it was, I would say, the most powerful and most uh, well choreographed event of, of all the ones I've covered. And his speech was incredibly powerful uh, and, and well put together. Um, it, it's essentially the same speech he's been giving since he ran for Senate um, in 2010, which is about his, the story of his family, his own story as the uh, son of immigrants. Um, but he does it very well. This is something that. It, even when Marco Rubio had, in the wake of his, uh, his push for immigration reform, which ended up collapsing, it passed the Senate, but then uh, the House, it died in the House amid a huge backlash among conserv the conservative movement. Um, it, in that, after that all happened, his, polls, his poll numbers and approval ratings among national Republicans collapsed. Um, and kind of, he kind of languished for a long time uh, that way. Um, but, but all through that period, if you talk to people who went and saw him speak in public, they would, they would still say, uh, you know, we can't count this guy out. He's an amazing communicator, probably the best communicator of the field right now, the best speaker. Um, there are, so, so those are the pluses. I think that the things to watch for him are um, he has a reputation for, uh, at least in his limited national political experience, for panicking when he hits a moment of uh, a tough moment. Um, uh, and so there are questions about, will he overcompensate if he, he starts to struggle in the, in the campaign? Will he uh, start throwing punches wildly? Not literally, but you know, rhetorically. Um, so th those are the things to watch with him. But he's a, he's a very effective speaker and communicator. And that's something that everybody who sees him speak will, will say. Well, you know what my big question about him? And you know, it's getting harder and harder to sort of take. You were talking about how so many things happen that don't matter. And social media takes big things and makes them small. And it takes small things and makes them big. And, you, it's, and it used to be that you could go out into an audience of, of potential voters and sort of get their real opinions. Now everybody wants to sound like a cable pundit. It's like you go out there and say, what are you looking for? Oh, I'm looking for a leader. Um, so what I've done lately is I like to eavesdrop on people yeah. in these audiences talking to each other. I mean, some of my best reporting has been like in the ladies' room at Republican <laughs> events. And the question I keep hearing, and it just feels to me like people are debating among themselves, is, is Marco Rubio young and refreshing and the future? Or is Marco Rubio a little not quite ready and maybe 2024 is his year? And that I've actually heard in several audiences, people sort of discussing among themselves. And he's going to have to sort of bring people along on Whoa. the good parts of being young without the things that make you scared. Of David well, knows that the America would never elect a young freshman senator. Well, but you raise a, but that's right. But, you know, you raise a point. I mean, you know, I, I've, I've rehearsed this a lot, but I've, I've always said that I felt like when you have succession elections, people tend to choose not the replica of what they have, but the remedy. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that just by party, but also by all kinds of other characteristics. So, Nate, I, 
you, you know the history of senators generally getting elected uh, president in the last, uh, I mean, only three since the, the uh, uh, in the last 120 whatever years, uh, Obama being the third, John F. Kennedy was the uh, one before him. Uh, what, what, how do you, in your world, how do you factor in the sort of post-Obama effect on all of this? I don't tend to think of Obama as having a big influence on who the Republicans are going to select. I do think that historically there's some evidence that parties tend to moderate over time. So like if the Republicans were going to choose someone crazy, it was like they were likelier to have done it in 2012 than 2016 than 2020, which makes sense. The longer you're out of the White House, the more desperate mm -hmm. you are to get back into it. Goldwater is 64, not 68. Um, McGovern, 72, not 76. When I look at Rubio, though, I, I think about the Republican Party as being this deeply factionalized place. There are very conservative voters that you might think of as being the Tea Party. There are evangelicals. There are moderates. There are libertarians. And I don't think that Marco Rubio is a candidate that like, naturally appeals to any one of these constituencies. And I think all of these factions are likelier to instead to flock the person that, is, that, that represents them. Like The Tea Partiers are going to be more inclined towards someone like Ted Cruz or Scott Walker than Marco Rubio. And you can do this for any of the factions. And so to me, that raises the bar on just how good Rio, Rubio has to be to break through. And you can talk me into the idea that Rubio is a great communicator, but I'm not sure that he is the superb communicator that would allow him to make up for not having a natural base in the party. I want to ask about one more Republican, and then we ought to talk about the Democrats. Uh, Rand Paul, uh, you know, you have a very large field there. Uh, obviously, being, being able to differentiate yourself within that field is important. Being able to perhaps bring uh, uh, a core group to these caucus, very crowded caucuses and primaries are important. It seems like, at least in the early run, that uh, Rand Paul has a play here, does he not? And um, what is your impression of, of what's, what he's doing out there? Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, Rand Paul's ideal scenario is that every one of these candidates stays in the race and that a bunch more join, because then he, the, the winner of Iowa and New Hampshire and South Carolina doesn't have to win 25 or 30 percent of the vote. He might only have to win 10 or 15 percent of the vote, probably not 10, 15, right? And, that, and for Rand Paul, who is banking on carrying the, his father's libertarian base, uh, that could be... He, he, he won't feel like he has to add that much to that base to, in order to pull out victories in some of these early primary states. I also think his project, his, his kind of experiment is the most interesting of any of these because he's not, he, his, uh, he's not just uh, trying to fit into one niche, right? He, Marco Rubio has this issue, but it's totally different. Rand Paul's idea is in the primaries to pair his, his base of uh, libertarians uh, with um, a, a selection of evangelicals who he can convince that his criminal justice reform is an essentially Christian uh, uh, idea or platform. And then a, a section of the business wing who like his deregulatory message. And, and, and that he can pitch certain ingredients of his libertarianism to different parts of the Republican, uh, of the Republican primary electorate and, and build a, co a kind of a hodgepodge coalition. It's never been done before, so which is why there's reason to doubt that it'll work. But it's certainly an interesting play. Nate, how far do you think that that can get him? I think that gets him through Iowa and New Hampshire, and then he loses. Mm -hmm. I think that he, I think the best. I think that's basically the best case scenario. And he can win caucuses. He can win lots of Western caucuses. And again, two of the first four states are caucus states, mm -hmm. and one of them has "live free or die" on the license plate. I think he could totally win New Hampshire and Iowa and Nevada. He could even go three for four. But if he wins New Hampshire, Iowa, and Nevada, four. doesn't that give him a, a, a decent no, amount the rest of, of the party would lose now. its mind, yeah, yeah. and true. they would consolidate because quickly behind fact, anyone the, else. In fact, the day he announced. There was, a, I think, a million dollar ad buy from neoconservatives who were terrified at the prospect of him and his relatively non-interventionist message, uh, you know, emerging victorious from the primary. So it, you, it's probably true that even if he wins three of the first four states, the rest of the party and the establishment would coalesce around just defeating Rand Paul. La last question on, on the Republicans. Um, they've got a series of debates coming up. Uh, and uh, this huge, huge group of candidates. What are the implications of that, Jill? What about 
how do you, now I know Fox has made one decision, uh, uh, CNN has made another decision about how they're going to handle it. Yeah. Uh, how do you distinguish yourself in those debates? And how do you even get into those well, debates? Well, first you have to distinguish yourself in order to get into the debates. And so we see things like Carly Fiorina, who has gone unmentioned so far, uh, you know, having a press conference outside of a Hillary Clinton appearance in South Carolina. I mean, you know, the attention getting is, is absolutely imperative. The headlines are imperative at this point because, you know, you have to crack the top 10 to get into the top debate. I think there's two tiers of debates on, on CNN. On CNN. And then and Fox, I guess, is just going to have one debate with people who... With what, the top 10. 10, 10 yeah. Top 10. It really seems like a very unfair way to do it, especially when you consider that governors like John Kasich, for instance, in Ohio, has not even gotten into the race yet, so he's not registering, and yet he's been in Congress. And, you know, and add that the RNC has explicitly said anyone who participates in non-sanctioned debates will be barred from the official debates. So it's really, you can make a case in Because if, if you're already not qualified for the official debates, right. why not get barred? Right. Well, that's true, but they, they would probably hope that in the coming months they'll be able to crack that top 10. It does seem, I mean, you hear a lot of these, lo the lower tier candidates say that this is the RNC kind of taking too much control of the process and, and locking out some people who would have legitimate claims to run. I mean, Bobby Jindal is a two-term governor in Louisiana. He will probably not get into the first debate, whereas if Donald, if Donald Trump, Trump he runs, he will, you know. Well, it'll make it fun. <laughs> um, sure some of us be. remember right. 1980 when Ronald Reagan had one of his great moments by turning on the organizers for trying to bar candidates from a Republican debate. So we'll see. Maybe someone will distinguish themselves uh, in that way. Let's let's turn to the Democrats because I know we want to take some uh, questions. And so I think we have a Democratic poll. There it is. It's less close than the other one. <laughs> um, now, uh, a lot has been made in the last few days uh, in this Washington Post poll that Hillary Clinton, and, and in both polls that her numbers are, her national numbers are uh, deflating. In fact, there was a headline in the Post today saying Clinton rivals pounce as her ratings fall. Nate, how much are her ratings falling among Democrats? Not much. Just her favorability ratings are still in the 80s. Those numbers are very high. They're about as good as, it's, as the numbers have ever been for a candidate at this stage in the primary. Um, I think actually, if, if she's still at 60 or 62, that is still the best ever um, for a candidate at this stage in the primary. And I think that the overall decline in her, her ratings was inevitable to a certain degree. When she was Secretary of State, she was in a nonpartisan position. Her ratings among Republicans and independents grew. And now that she's returned back into the fray, and admittedly in a particularly problematic way at times, but she's back in the fray, and her ratings among Republicans and independents are back to where they should be. And yet, Jill, you have questions about her candidacy or about her campaign. You've written about that. Um, I think it's a shame that Democrats don't have more options uh, that are um, you know, competitive with Hillary Clinton. I, I don't see Bernie Sanders or Martin O'Malley or Lincoln Chafee as particularly competitive with her, at least not now and probably not ever. Um, I mean, obviously, we in Illinois think Lincoln's a good name, but yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, you know, there are so many issues that could chip her up. Uh, not any of these other candidates, but her own issues. You know, the Clinton Foundation money, the emails that she kept apart from her official position at the State Department, uh, the whole issue of trust that could uh, nullify some of the advantages that Democrats have on issues and demographics. Uh, so, you know, it, it, there are a lot of problems. Um, and, uh, and yet they don't seem to show up in these polls. No. I mean, I remember when all the Romney people were so shocked that Obama won in 2012. And I, I was working at National Journal at the time. And, and basically, the conclusion was, it doesn't matter if people run to the polls or trudge to the polls. You know, if, if they get to the polls, the candidate's going to win. Whether there's a, you know, they thought, well, there's no enthusiasm on the Democratic side. Well, that may have been true. People were lukewarm, but they voted, and, and he won. And so, you know, I think that Hillary Clinton's going to have a lot of dutiful Democrats going to the polls, and uh, because the issues they care about are 
really much more important to them than, uh, than who is going to be, you know, they, as long as it's a Democrat choosing the next Supreme Court nominee, they don't care whether it's Hillary Clinton or someone else. I, I, I mean, it, it would take, at this point, uh, no, it would just take a catastrophic event to deny her the nomination. One of those three or four people running is not going to deny her the nomination. It is going to be some major event. I'm just curious, uh, how many here uh, would like to see uh, another Democratic candidate? How many? <laughs> how many of you are Republicans? <laughs> it's Hyde Park. <laughs> uh, I didn't say anything. The, uh, it is not surprising. <laughs> this issue, uh, though, that uh, Jill raises, uh, well, first of all, let me ask you this, McKay. You, you, given your, your constituency at, at BuzzFeed, the, the preponderant number of your constituents are young. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the general sentiment among the folks who read you? Well, it's, I mean, I think that there, there's actually a long discussion to be had about how Hillary Clinton uh, plays on, on social media and among younger, uh, younger voters. Certainly well, BuzzFeed's cliff readership. The, the cliff notes are that um, they certainly are more, I think our readers, it's safe to say, are more liberal than Hillary Clinton. Um, and, and, you know, may not necessarily be, a, a lot of them weren't around when Bill Clinton was president or weren't paying attention. Um, that said, there is a, uh, the, I mean, I don't think you can uh, discount the excitement around the idea of the first woman president. I think that um, uh, 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 since Hillary Clinton ran the first time, an entire uh, community of, uh, of uh, kind of vibrant, active community of feminists and um, uh, on the internet has emerged and, and drives a lot of the social media conversation. They share stories about Hillary Clinton. They, uh, at BuzzFeed, when you know, we have our, the journalists and when we write tough stories about Hillary Clinton, our readers are not very prone to share them. They're not excited to post them on their Facebook wall. When there's a video of her doing something sort of charming on the campaign trail, our readers are very excited to share them. So while I think that certainly some of her policy positions may not be perfectly in sync or in line with our readership, there, there is a genuine excitement about the idea of the first, you know, of America electing the first woman president. And uh, young liberal BuzzFeed readers are, uh, they, they respond to that. Nate, let me ask you a question about this issue that Jill raised, the one of, uh, of trust. As you look at the sort of factors, characteristics that you consider leading indicators, uh, characteristics that people look for in presidential candidates, uh, where, does, where does trust rank? It's pretty good. And her ratings are not good by historic standards. But on the other hand, no one's ratings are good by historic standards. And that includes, by the way, recent presidential elections. Like President Obama's approval ratings and even his favorability ratings weren't great, Romney's weren't great. They're worse than Kerry's in 04, for instance. And that's in part just because people are sorting their partisan corners. It's a lot harder to sustain a 55, 60% favorability rating than it used to be. And I just don't know what to make of uh, these sort of indicators in, in an era of such close partisanship. I don't know that they are telling us as much as I think they would have 10 years ago. Uh, you know, because I, uh, I just wonder, um, in, in 2012, for example, much was made, and I think it was significant. Romney had an advantage on, uh, he was just here and he made this point, he had an advantage on the economy, on, uh, on sort of managerial experience, but he fell way, 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 way short on cares about people like me, mm -hmm. on the basic empathy uh, standards, which seem very important to people. The, the, thing of, the question I guess, is, will they, yes. will they tolerate a lot of faults would, if they think that Hillary you Clinton's, are yeah. in tune with their concerns? I think that's right. And I'd also note that Hillary Clinton's <laughs> mediocre ratings on an issue like trust are not nearly as wide as the problem that Mitt Romney had on empathy or who cares more about the middle class. And what was, when you see Mitt Romney getting like a 35 on a question, like, do you care about the middle class? That tells you that a whole bunch of people that usually vote for Republicans are not answering yes. And Hillary Clinton's numbers are in the mid 40s. And that's about what you would expect for a candidate in this era, I think. So Karen, the, 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 let, let's just uh, talk for a few minutes about what this campaign will 
turn on, what it's likely uh, to be about. Uh, in 2012, the Obama campaign talked a lot about the well-being of the middle class. That was a organizing. The Republican Party was somewhat resistant to that message. Now everybody seems to be uh, talking about the middle class. Right. Uh, why? Uh, because people are very, they, this recovery has not brought back the middle class. It has not been felt by the middle class. And I think more than anything else, people look at their kids and worry that there is not going to be the kind of opportunity for them that they would like to see. Um, but what I am still, it, I, none of us knows, is the degree to which this issue and who can speak to it and really make people feel like they understand what's going on and that they have a way out of this tunnel is what the world looks like. Because I think the rise of ISIS has freaked people out in a way that they haven't been freaked out in a very long time. People who couldn't tell you a Sunni from a Shiite or just what exactly Al Qaeda is, they know what ISIS is. And so I also think that there is likely to be a very huge national security component in this election. And does that, uh, does that hurt or help a Hillary Clinton, assuming she's the nominee? Um, I think she is, it's going to ride a lot on what people end up thinking about Barack Obama. Because she, however much she tries to extricate herself and say, I disagreed on this decision and that decision, the fact is people are of two minds about Barack Obama on foreign policy and national security. His approval ratings are pretty low on those issues. But if you put in front of people the exact decisions that Barack Obama has had to make, they're with him. They're with the decisions that he's made. They don't want boots on the ground. They do you know, want the air campaign to be given. They understand that this is difficult. And so I, that is, and you guys probably may have different opinions from me, but I think in a lot of ways her destiny has been written by her former boss. Nate, you, your paper had a poll today, uh, and in it, uh, the headline is Inequality Troubles Americans Across Party Lines. Uh, and the numbers were pretty strong and pretty compelling, and a lot of the sort of more, what you would call the more progressive uh, proposals, paid leave, higher minimum wage, and so on, all did well. Uh, how, do the how does the Republican Party navigate that, uh, that environment? I think it's extremely hard for them. I don't have an easy answer. I mean, the Republican I mean, there's this whole reform wing of the Republican Party that sort of argues that the, the party needs to do more to adjust its message and its policies to appeal to the working class. I am sure that with respect to Romney, they will move in the right direction. I'm not sure whether the party um, is ideologically flexible enough to permit them to move far enough to diffuse these various, very popular democratic economic proposals. And go ahead. Well, I, I, I think that's probably a fair point. I would also say that it is remarkable, even the term income inequality was, was um, something that conservatives and Republicans just a couple, few years ago, they, they hated that term. They thought, you would hear people call it a social, you know, it was socialist talk, right? Uh, now Marco Rubio, who was elected as a Tea Party candidate, he has since kind of divorced from the movement, uh, freely uses that term and he, he talks about it. I, I think it's certainly true that when you actually drill down to policy proposals, uh, it's going to be difficult for a Republican to win the, Republican, the presidential nomination in their party. Uh, while proposing uh, serious, dramatic uh, reform efforts to address income inequality. That said, the fact that Republicans are now politically allowed to talk about it uh, does mark, I, I don't think we should undersell it, does mark a pretty dramatic departure from even 2012. Well, I think that all the candidates are going to sound very similar on the campaign trail because they're all very concerned about this. And, the, and what's going to be the challenge is for Democrats and for Republicans is to prove that what they're proposing is going to fix it. And that will be, I think, more difficult for Republicans. But one of, one of the um, 
some of the evidence that they're, they've been on the wrong track is these uh, referendums where you see minimum wage passing in these states. Whenever people have a direct vote, they vote for some of these proposals. And so, you know, it, it's going to come down to are people going for sort of the gestalt, you know, are they looking at the aura of the candidate or are they going to actually pay some attention to what people are proposing? Because the record of people getting into the Oval Office and doing what they said they would do <laughs> is pretty good. They get there and they do what they said they're going to do. Although, I don't, again, these proposals, I mean, people do like raising the minimum wage, but, and they voted for these things, but it didn't help Democratic candidates in this last yeah. cycle. I think, it's and true. let's face it. But aren't presidential campaigns different? But I also think that the question is who's, whose message is going to feel like opportunity? Because people don't look down at their newborn babies and dream that someday they'll have a minimum wage job. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it's going to be a sense that. If, if you they know, did, we'd probably get a much higher <laughs> minimum wage. <laughs> but it's that, you know, my kid's going to have an opportunity to get the education that will fit him or her into the job market that he or she is not going to be just com so crippled with student debt that they can never afford to buy a house that you know they can live a life that's at least as good as the life that I've been living and I, I don't know I don't think that goes down to granular proposals and uh, I, and well, I think that for the last 50 years the Democrats have had an advantage in polls on which party is on what the parties mean. Democrats are for the middle class and the poor, basically, and the Republicans are for the rich. And it takes a lot, I think, for the Republicans to overcome that sense. And so if you think that voters are going to go into this election thinking about income inequality, and we know that the Republicans for their entire history have been seen by the public as the party of the rich, that, that's just like, it's, it's not a good situation to be in. And these Republican candidates are going, just because of the positions their party is forced into taking, are going to have to defend policies that are enough for a Democrat to say that is still the candidate of the rich. And they'll point at something like Marco's, Marco Rubio's tax plan to prove it. And given the, the prejudices why, that the parties come in about the parties, they'll go into it. Marco Rubio's tax plan? Well, I, uh, my colleague Josh Barrow <laughs> described it, I believe, as the uh, puppies and rainbows plan. Because in addition <laughs> to, it, it, I think it reduced the, t the tax on ca capital gains, for instance, to zero. Um, in addition to providing broad tax cuts for everyone. Um, and that's, when, you, when, the, when the average voter comes in already having these vague senses that the Republican, parties are for the, the Republican Party is for the rich, and Hillary Clinton gets to say that Marco Rubio wants to make it so that Mitt Romney doesn't have to pay a single dime in taxes, it's going to be a tough spot. But yeah. I, I, I hate to be too cynical about, uh, about how campaigns have, you know, work like this, but oh, Marco on. Rubio, it, 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 you, you can envision a race between Marco Rubio and Hillary Clinton. One is underwater on his mortgage. He actually is on his mortgage in his house in Miami. Um, he's never, you know, he's, he's a relatively came from working class roots, son of immigrants. The other is Hillary Clinton, who has made millions and millions and millions of dollars, even just in the last couple of years, even in the last few months, right? Um, it, you know, it, it, you can envision a way that Republicans could distract from the policy debate. It's not, it wouldn't be the first time that a, re a presidential can campaign re was removed from a, a substantive policy debate and made it about Hillary Clinton's personal wealth versus Marco Rubio's uh, personal biography and his story. Be, be interesting. I mean, you know, we've had some very wealthy presidents who uh, did, you know, Franklin Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy, uh, all of whom were quite wealthy and were seen as advocates for mm -hmm. Uh, inherited working people. wealth. Huh? Inherited wealth. They weren't out on the speech, you know, trail, raking it in, where we could see it. Do you? Uh, and I don't know the answer to this because I haven't really studied the polling. And maybe you've studied the polling. How much does that has that bothered folks? I, I don't think it's something. Yeah, I don't think people are paying attention. I think this is news that we have all digested. But that okay, you can. Just, by the way, if you folks yet. have questions, you can queue up right at that microphone there. Um, and we'll talk until you do. Um, the, uh, I have to, I, I think campaigns ultimately are about stories, long stories, and they're about aspirations, and they're, they're exactly what you say, though I do think there have to be proof points. And I do think that part of the gauntlet that I mentioned before is it gets, 
as people do start drilling down, if Marco Rubio is the nominee of the party, or Hillary Clinton for that matter, then their proposals actually matter and people begin to raise questions about them and put hundreds of millions of dollars behind those questions and suddenly they really do become part of either authenticating or, uh, or uh, uh, raising doubts about the fundamental themes of a campaign. So yes, sir. Is this on? Oh, oh, yeah. It is on, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Adam Shakoff. I'm a first year alum here just for Alumni Weekend. But so thank, thank you everyone for coming in, for putting on, on this event. Uh, I just would like to, I mean, it's clear that conventional wisdom and everyone here, including myself, believes that Hillary Clinton will be the Democratic nominee. That being said, I'd like to go back to an earlier example of back in the 1988 election. I mean, I, I wasn't alive then, but uh, Pat Robertson ran was at, at that point considered a long shot uh, candidacy for the, for the Republican nomination, even though he lost. Uh, Looking back, it seemed like that campaign gave the, the religious right a much needed shot in the arm, especially as moral majority was starting to shut down at that point. I think and then Jerry Falwell was, was in trouble, and eventually that campaign infrastructure that Pat Robertson put in place morphed into the Christian coalition, which became a, you know, a huge force in national politics within the Republican Party. And so potentially, even if Bernie Sanders doesn't win the nomination or beat Hillary Clinton, could he do this, I guess, replicate Robertson's success on the right for the left. I mean, we've seen him drawing overflow crowds, even Occupy Wall Street's endorsed him, so he has like a clear base for, that he's exciting, so could he kind of repeat history on the left, uh, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, even if he loses? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take it if you want. Um, I think that uh, my answer would be no, because people on the left aren't the same as people on the right. I mean, I could be wrong here, but I think the reason that Bernie Sanders is doing so well right now is that because he's like the Ted Cruz of the left and it points up how few people there are like this and how, you know, when there was an Occupy Wall Street movement, everyone was saying, oh, that'll be the new Tea Party on, of the left. Well, it didn't happen that way. I mean, I think Democrats are more, and you can see this in polls, I think, they're more uh, prone to compromise, you know, they're more open to compromise and uh, they're, you know, more willing to take the half loaf and get and move the ball forward an inch to use as many cliches as I can. And, <laughs> uh, but you know maybe Nate can can back me up on that. But I just don't see it. <laughs> really, I mean, thumbs up from Nate. That's a... <laughs> Is that a cliche? <laughs> do, you, do you remember the the 2004 slogan "Date Dean, Mary Carey"? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that there's an element of this. Uh, I mean, let me just ask and uh, thank you for your question. I. Um, I wonder um, whether uh, you guys have some thoughts on the Republican, uh, the Democratic field, such as it is Bernie Sanders, Martin O'Malley, and uh, I guess Lincoln Chafee is now in the field, and maybe Jim Webb. Um, does Bernie is Bernie Sanders the the principal alternative candidate here, or what? What, what do you guys think? And, and how is that possible? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I, I have a theory on this, but. I have two thoughts on the field. One is Sanders is the natural candidate of the only natural opposition to Clinton. Mm -hmm. So I think, he, I think that he is, the, as of now, going to be, I think he's the likeliest single person to win a state other than Hillary Clinton. I also think, though, that if something cataclysmic happens to Hillary Clinton and she does not win the nomination, which we cannot rule out, that none of these candidates will be the Democratic nominee and someone else would enter the race. Yeah, it's, for instance, I mean, there's, the, it, the lack of a Democratic bench is pretty stunning. But take, for instance, again, if for some reason Hillary Clinton were knocked out of the race, um, a Republican, it is electorally impossible at this moment for a Republican to win the presidency without winning the state of Virginia, right? And so, Look, you've got Tim Kaine, you've got Mark Warner. I, you know, I, I just think there are people who might step into a vacuum that maybe aren't necessarily occurring to us at this moment. Okay, but uh, thank you. Oh, you're gone. Yes, you go ahead. <laughs> So uh, uh, just going back to something that um, Nate Cohen mentioned earlier, which is if Rand Paul wins the first few primaries, the you know the the, uh, the collective in the Republican Party is going to try to destroy him. Um, I saw an analysis somebody had done that said 
if you actually took the whole population and said, what do you truly believe, and you looked at the different positions everybody has, Rand Paul actually matches our electorate's beliefs better than any other <laughs> candidate. And so, I guess abstracting, you know, what does this mean about the two-party system and our elections when we can't get to a situation where, you know, the parties will allow a candidate that actually reflects a lot of the beliefs of the population to get through um, to the rest of the, to the electorate? Well, let us, for purposes of the question, stipulate that Rand Paul is a perfect reflection of yeah. the mainstream. <laughs> but uh, McKay, why don't you handle that? Uh, yeah, I, th I think that is a big if. I, I do think there are certain issues that that's pro that, the, of which that's true. Um, it, it, I think that you know you hear a lot of Paulites uh, dating back to Ron Paul's uh, most enthusiastic supporters who are now going to Rand Paul complain about this a lot. They you know they say. That we shouldn't have to take a our candidate Rand Paul and make him sh and have him and kind of shoehorn him into the Republican Party and make him uh, you know jump through hoops and do all these things to try to grab little portions of all the different uh, tribes within the Republican Party. He should be able to run uh, as a libertarian candidate or as a third party candidate, and uh, you know. <laughs> It's an interesting debate to have. It's an interesting intellectual exercise. Um, but the barrier to entry is just so high for a third party candidate. Um, and, and traditionally, it would not be somebody like Rand Paul who would succeed running as, a, as an independent or a third party candidate. Um, the, the, I think the last one that took off and gained traction was Ross Perot. Um, you, certainly, there are not a lot of similarities, I, I think, between Ross Perot and Rand Paul. Um, but, but I think, you know. Rand Paul has, what's interesting to me about Rand Paul is that he's basically accepted defeat in this regard. He doesn't think that there's any near future scenario where a third party candidate could actually emerge and, and make uh, a mark on the electorate. So what he's doing is trying to reform the Republican Party from the inside. Yes. I'd like to ask a hypothetical question about the Republican uh, primary process, um, since it seems to be the one we agree is going to be closer. Um, Could somebody I, move that microphone up for that poor guy? He's gonna <laughs> I don't, can be crippled by the end of this. I, I don't go to this university. I'm not an engineering major, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. So anyway, um, let's just use a sports metaphor here. Say it goes in the double OT, and we have um, three candidates, none of which would have a plurality or a, a majority of the votes or delegates uh, when it comes to the RNC. What can we expect from uh, that kind of a uh, scenario? Something um, that we have all dreamed and <laughs> wished for our whole lives. It's a political journalist <laughs> fantasy, I think. I think that's uh, <laughs> is a broker no. convention. Not, not names, right. no? no. What's the date on that? I don't know. It's <laughs> <laughs> ever happened. Well, the, I, I would be interested in your take on this. Is that, you know, what's the possibility that this would happen? I think it's really unlikely, in part because of winner take all primaries in the second <laughs> half of the season. but. It's fun. I mean, the way that, the, the, understand the Republican Party worked very hard on their rules this time to try and, first of all, keep the process becoming, from becoming unruly. I don't think it anticipated, you know, two dozen candidates. But uh, also to limit the way, the number of debates, to keep a tight control over those debates so you don't have some of the uh, kind of uh, spectacles that we saw in 2012. And they've developed rules that are meant to yield a nominee a, as quickly as they possibly can, maybe by the end of March, uh, because the extension of the race in 2012 was not helpful to Romney. He got a late start. And I think there is, uh, there is a, an urgency to get past the primary so that they can try and appeal to a broader electorate than they do in a primary. So I, I, I don't. I kind of agree with Nate. I don't see that happening. Uh, just as a follow-up question, um, if in the event you say that they have this sort of system where it's easy to pick a candidate, um, could that lead them picking the wrong candidate? I mean, I feel like that if you <laughs> jump to a sort of a candidate, it like depends that, on your point of view. I guess. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess we'll wait and see then. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. This is sort of a, a two-part question, although both parts are not necessarily related. Uh, I guess our discussion, your discussion uh, this evening would not be as robust but for the Citizens United case, which is sort of a stepping stone into the first part of the question, and that is, um, shouldn't there be more of an emphasis 
on the role of the next president selecting Supreme Court justices uh, rather than typically where uh, the, uh, getting involved in selecting the next Supreme Court justice or two is not necessarily a big issue. And, and the Democrats, it would seem to me, should emphasize that more, so I'd like to comment on that. The second part is, despite the, 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 the sad state of his present family issues, how come Joe Biden hasn't stepped up or has he been told not to? Uh, the fir uh, to the first, <laughs> to your first question, um, I think it's true that we don't necessarily talk a lot in campaigns or hear a lot in presidential campaigns about Supreme Court justice, although you certainly do. I remember specifically in 2008, Barack Obama saying something about how um, uh, Roe v. Wade hangs in the balance, uh, depending on the you know who, who's appointed to the, the courts. But but I do think that the fact that abortion is always an issue in these campaigns uh, and it, it is a very uh, you know emotional and and, and potent uh, wedge issue in these campaigns it does go back to the fact that ultimately these are supreme these are issues that end up before the Supreme Court you know I have to oh, go ahead oh, I was just gonna say I, I'm really surprised actually that there hasn't been more advertising on the Supreme Court because abortion it's true it, it is always a big issue but there are so many economic issues that come before yeah. the court that someone could really do a series of commercials about people affected or businesses affected either way although I think Democrats might find that that it would work more to, for them but you know this is I don't think pe this is part of the disconnect that people have with politics, they don't understand how it affects their lives. You know, if you talk to the plaintiffs in some of these cases and do ad campaigns, maybe people would understand what's at stake, but I, I don't think people think about it nearly enough. Uh, there are a couple of big decisions coming up that will certainly highlight the role of the court, including one on the Health Reform Act, but I have to tell you, in my lifetime, I, everybody always talks about this issue, but I can't remember one instance in which it was determinative yeah. in the outcome of a presidential I think it was race. meaningful in 92 because it was coming so soon after Clarence Thomas. It certainly was meaningful, you know, in the, in the Senate races, but... In the Senate yeah. races, yeah, but uh, in any case, and as to your second question, anybody want to answer the Biden question? Happy to... I, my thought on Biden is that even in that scenario in which Hillary Clinton cannot win the nomination and people jump in, that Joe Biden still would not be the Democratic nominee. I just don't think he's a. I don't think he's a great politician. He's run twice for the presidency and gotten one percent of the vote. A lot of people don't take him seriously. The Democratic elite doesn't take him seriously. Yeah. Now, as I turn to the Democratic elite. <laughs> no, I, look, I, I can't. I'm. Con <laughs> I'm, I'm conflicted out uh, of answering the question because Joe Biden is a great friend of mine, yeah, I and I have enormous respect and high regard for him. And, uh, and my thoughts are very much with him and his family right now. And I think that's where his thoughts are too. So, thank, thank you. you. Hi. Um, first of all, I, I do admire all the work that you all do. I do read Pulse, BuzzFeed, and read uh, New York Times and all that. But I sometimes sort of think that there's, I'm sort of torn because I hear all these like, issues and stuff that are spinning about. And yet, as a former DNC member and still a political uh, participant, I know that those issues are not, that's not the issues that are gonna make it. I mean, they're not what, I mean, what, what it's really doing is we as a party are trying to sort out, like when you say would there be another candidate than Hillary Clinton, one of the reasons why I think it's so strong is because we all remember, you know, Puma. There's, there, there are still those Puma folks that, are, that think that it's just her time. Regardless of whatever happens, it's her time because they felt she got shafted eight years ago. So does it, how much does it all matter, particularly in the, because this is all about local politics, party selection, and a lot of that has more to do with political posturing than actual getting to the core of these things that you're that you write about that you spend time on. Karen, do you wanna? Yeah, you know, it's really the other thing that's happened is that 
again, we, we talked a little bit about the polarization, that, that the country is so deeply divided and so closely divided that who wins is the, you know, the, the field goal unit, the, you know, people who get out their people. And, you know, I think a big, big question of this next election is going to be how much of the Obama coalition shows up when Obama is not at the top of the ticket. And we know that they don't show up in midterm elections. So the question is, has the party developed, do they have a candidate who can bring them out? And do they have, have they figured out how to get them out? You're what, talking what, about post, can, after the nomination, right? After, uh, yeah, after the nomination. When we interviewed, when, when our uh, editor at BuzzFeed interviewed President Obama a few months ago, he, they, we put this question to him, you know, who, it, it, do, do you believe that Hillary Clinton will uh, inherit the coalition of the ascendant that we, we've called that helped elect President Obama and reelect him? And his answer was nobody inherits the last candidate's coalition, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that is the open question uh, for Hillary Clinton. I, I, I think there's pretty convincing polling so far that they probably would turn out for her, but it's, it does remain to be seen whether they would be as excited and whether they'd turn out in the same numbers. For the next slot. Go ahead. Everybody. Oh, well, I was just going to say, she is going to have a slightly different coalition, but the, there is the female excitement factor. So if, if black voters don't turn out quite so high for her, people who are planning her campaign say that they're mm -hmm. hoping to make it up with female black mm -hmm. voters. And same with young people. Um, and she's certainly kind of hitting all the, the I don't know if you want to call it stations of the cross, but you know, on immigration, she'd go further than Obama, she says. She's doing voting rights. She's talked about criminal justice reform. She went to South Carolina, talked to a women's group about paid leave. You know, she's kind of putting herself out there for all the groups that are going to, she's going to need to have excited. Nate, you have any thoughts? I, I haven't written a lot of this yet, um, but I am. We I, won't tell anybody. I, yeah, don't tell anyone. <laughs> Turn off the camera. I am. I am very strongly of the view that I mean the Obama coalition is just the Democratic coalition yeah. at this point, and that there is basically no realistic scenario, un unless that like national turnout returns to something like the year two thousand or ninety six, that it stays home. I just think I, it's, it, Obama was not nearly as dependent on unusual levels of turnout as people think. And Will Fernandez, our departing leader of the IOP. Yeah, give me my last question. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for coming. But more importantly, thank you for going through what seems like one of the craziest jobs in covering a presidential election. Uh, something that I wouldn't uh, put on my worst enemy. Uh, but with that, in covering this entire process, what is something that you would want to change about the process to make either your jobs easier or more interesting? Hmm. Can I ask? A, I'll, can I, I ask? Answer it in the other way around, which is I think that America's unusually undemocratic democratic system is really great for my job. <laughs> and that if we went to a national popular vote and like the states stopped mattering and we stopped caring about congressional districts the way yeah. we do, that my job would be a lot less interesting. So I'm grateful, actually, for the complexities and undemocratic and the undemocratic character of our political system. What an inspiring note. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think if there was one thing I could change, it would be just the transparency. I think I think campaigns are far less transparent than than they used to be. I think the candidates are shrink wrapped. You know, the media can't get to them. The voters can't get to them. You, you know, sometimes you feel like you're not covering the candidates. You're covering the candidates on YouTube. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I would really like to bring back, at least maybe I'm romanticizing this, but a little more of the, you know, the actual authenticity. This dovetails with that point, but I, I've just finished writing, and I'm in the revisions for a book about the battle over the future of the Republican Party. And a lot of it, the time is spent uh, it, on these characters, these people we've been talking about, these now candidates. And uh, a few years ago, were kind of combatants in the battle of ideas within the party. And you know, there, I, I wish, I read some of the great you know, political nonfiction of decades past. And it, it seems like there was a time, and may, again, maybe this is romanticizing it, when candidates and politicians 
gave a decent amount of access to journalists. And not in, it wasn't something you had to barter for and negotiate over and uh, suck up to them for forever to be able to get. It was just, you know, it was seen as part of the process. You subjected yourself to spending time with journalists. And they interviewed you. And they spent a lot of time asking you questions. And they followed you around. And, uh, and they got a, tried to get a sense of who, who they were. Um, I, I did get access to a lot of the subjects that, um, that I wrote about, not all of them, but it was a grueling process in a lot of the cases. And uh, I wish, and maybe Be, it's Being a, with them or getting access? Meeting with, yeah, right. <laughs> S sitting down with them even, even, getting to the point where you're across the table asking them questions is often a ridiculous, you have to jump through a ridiculous number yeah. of hoops. I wish that wasn't the case. I mean, if I could leave you with one book recommendation, it would, well, besides McKay's when it comes out. In December, um, yes. Thanks um, for the plug. A friend of mine has written a book called One Car Caravan. His name is Walter Shapiro. And it's about an era that, as Karen has said, has just disappeared. Uh, he, he was alone following candidates. There was nobody else there. I don't think there's been a phase of this campaign when that's been true, or, or of 2012. There is never a moment when you're the only person out there. There's always a throng. I think it probably has to do with the internet and, and the proliferation of digital outlets, but people are out all over. Candidates are running full out you know, for nearly two years. And um, it's just, if you want to see what it used to be like, check it out. <laughs> I wrote a few pages about that in my book, too, so I, <laughs> I, um, uh, I the only thing that I, I think the other element that nobody's mentioned here is what money has done to the process, yes. which I think has been really distorting. Uh, the only thing that I would say in favor of it is that it, it does in its own absurd, maddening way ultimately yield, I think, a real sense of who these people are. I think I said in 2011 that presidential campaigns were MRIs for the soul. And I still believe that. I think that especially those candidates who make it to the late rounds are, are known. And they're known in part because they're subjected to all these ridiculous trials um, during the course of this campaign. Uh, and yes, I, I too miss that era of interaction. I think candidates don't believe they need you guys as no, much as totally. they did before. Um, and uh, because there's so many other ways to communicate. Um, but I do think that the, the, the gauntlet does produce ultimately a sense of who these people are. And, there's, some, and there's, val there's important value to that. I think we could do it better. I think we can, there's no doubt we can do it better, although maybe not to the satisfaction of Nate, um, <laughs> not to satisfy his needs. Uh, but, uh, but I think you, you, we will know who these people are by the end of it, and then we'll make a choice as to who we trust, and, 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 and uh, maybe trust is the wrong word, but about who we want to commit the, uh, the country to, give the keys to the country to in the next uh, four years. Hey, Steve's waiting to wrap it up. I thought of one thing that I didn't ask. How much, if at all, does it matter that we have a Republican Congress uh, We've had the scorched earth battle over the last uh, six years. Uh, how much would that influence people's thinking, if at all, about who to elect as president? I think there's a huge amount of pressure on the Republican Congress to show that they can govern. That, again, I mean, if you're going to give them, as Obama's favorite metaphor, you know, the keys to the car. Uh, yeah, I think, I think so much is writing right now on Mitch McConnell. Uh, well, let's go down the line and then end with Steve. <laughs> I, I would just say that approval ratings in general for Congress, if you ask that question of voters, uh, are absurdly, preposterously low. People are very, very unhappy with Congress. So you can almost make the case that whichever party is controlling Congress uh, has a disadvantage when it comes to the, uh, you know, elections and politics because they're, they're receiving more of the blame for how dysfunctional Congress is. I'm just not sure how much attention people are going to pay to Congress when they're choosing the president. I mean, I think, you know, it's such a personal choice, and there's, and there's going to be so much exposure of all of these people that, you know, it's going to come down to who do you trust, who do you agree with, who do you like. I wonder whether it could matter on the Republican side. They're going to have both houses of Congress in 2017, which is possible, although they could lose the Senate. Right. 
I would think that would be seen as an opportunity for them to gamble on a more conservative candidate and, as Scott Walker says, go big and go bold. And on that note, I want to thank our panelists, Nate, Jill, McKay, Karen, and our founder and director, David Axelrod, for an extraordinary conversation. Thank you all very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Let me also thank all of you for being here. Let me also uh, welcome back officially all alums. For those of you who want more of this, whether this is your first time and you're based in Chicago or you're just back on campus, we encourage you to sign up for our newsletter at politics.uchicago.edu. You'll be kept abreast on everything that we're doing throughout the academic year. You can also catch many of our events online, many of the videotapes. So uh, even if you're away from campus, you can be connected to the IOP. We encourage you to do so and to support our work. Thank you all very much. Have a great evening and enjoy Alumni Weekend.